Today I want to discuss 20 problems with the Big Bang and this is from the perspective of a quantum field theorist. So I see a lot of problems looking at elementary issues related to quantum field theory that don't even get discussed by astrophysicists and amateurs and people in the media. But first it's good to say what's the definition of the universe or space. Linguistically, the universe is everything. It's a collection of everything and there's only one. And we can consider it more in terms of it being a container of everything, of all matter. And a container that's boundless in both space and time. And space, we can think of the same way. We can think of the universe containing all space and all matter, while we can consider space to be a boundless region containing all matter. And then we can look at regions of space, if we want, but collectively we're talking about all the space in the universe, which means the universe. So when we're trying to talk about the origin of the universe in a purely linguistic sense, we're talking about the origin of the material substance within the universe. And you can say matter, although linguistically there's a problem with the definition of matter. It normally says matter has mass. But quantum matter, quantum fluctuations, are massless. But quantum fluctuations are still a material substance. So that's problematic. So in science we have to say that quantum fluctuations, as a quantum field theorist, that quantum fluctuations are a material substance, are a form of matter that is contained by space or the universe. So the number one problem I have with the Big Bang Theory is the quantum field exists. Under quantum field theory, the quantum field always exists. It always must exist. There's, whenever you have the abstract concept of a universe or, or the universe or space, then they are filled with quantum fluctuations. And as far as we know, the scientific evidence says we always have quantum fluctuations in all space as we know it. It's not optional physics. And that's problematic with the idea that the universe had a beginning because there doesn't appear to be a beginning with the quantum field. And if the quantum field already exists, you can't have a beginning of the universe because the universe had to exist first. And not only that, because the universe is really an abstract constant, construct, not a material substance. In the abstract sense, it, the universe always exists. The question is whether it's filled with something, and it's filled with the quantum field. So there really is no beginning. You have quantum field everywhere for all time. And number two, I have the quantum field doesn't come from the Big Bang. And we know that in a large part because of the energy of the quantum field. Wheeler estimated the energy based on the standard quantum field energy density equation as 10 to the 94th grams per centimeter cubed in mass equivalent energy. Well, the visible universe mass has been estimated at 10 to the 56 grams in total. So there's more energy in my little pinky than there is in all the visible universe of non-quantum field energy. So there's no way for the quantum field energy to come from a Big Bang. A Big Bang is like a fish fart in an ocean. At best you get a small bubble. It's not, it's not a thing, it, it's, it's a scientific impossibility right there. 
And that also points to a more general problem with the Big Bang Theory. Number three, the Big Bang violates energy conservation because it's a something from nothing theory. And you can't get something from nothing, you have to start with something. And under quantum field theory, you start with quantum field, and quantum field gets its energy from previous quantum field to infinity. Because we have no beginning or ending of the quantum field. So number three, dimensions and time come from the Big Bang. I mean, don't come from the Big Bang. They come from the quantum field. And the reason we know they come from the quantum field is quantum field contains quantum fluctuations. Quantum fluctuations have wavelengths and frequencies. Wavelengths are in meters, so frequencies are in cycles per second. So time and dimensions already exist in the quantum field, so they exist prior to a hypothetical Big Bang. And that's important because it relates to some of the other problems I'll talk about. So number five, we have the quantum field dimensions don't change. And that's, this is an important part of quantum field theory. A quantum field has a rest frame. It has a frame where the speed of light's at its maximum, as Maxwell determined, and the permittivity and permeability, the electric and magnetic constants, are at their minimum. And there isn't a way to change the uh, dimensions in the quantum field. So they're fixed. And not only are they fixed, or because they're fixed, the quantum field dimensions are geometrically flat. We have to treat them as flat. There's no curvature of the quantum field. The quantum field rest range is flat. An observer that moves doesn't change the dimensions of the quantum field. And while a body like a star can change the permittivity and permeability of space, it doesn't change the dimensions of space. So next we have seven, the Big Bang would make a black hole. And this should be obvious to anyone who's looked at black hole theory. Anytime you have a really dense mass that is more than three times the mass of our sun, it should form a black hole or something approximating a black hole. So we have a case where if you took all the energy in the universe, converted it to matter, and had it in a small region, it would form a black hole. And it wouldn't be able to expand from there. And even more problematically, if you take the 10 to the 56 gram estimate, then that forms a black hole with uh, that's 15.7 light years away. And what that tells us is that G as a gravitational constant is a constant in the way we think of black hole theories. So it's necessary to revisit black holes on the scale of the universe. They can apparently exist on a small scale, but we can't sum the entire mass of the universe and say there's a black hole the size of the universe. Number eight, the Big Bang violates the speed of light limit. And that's because the speed of light limit already exists because it's part of the quantum field. Because the quantum field already has dimensions and time, and it already has permittivity and permeability, the electric and magnetic constant, and you multiply the electric constant times magnetic constant, you get one over the speed of light squared. So the speed of light also emerges from the quantum field. So the speed of light limit's already always there. And when you think about a Big Bang theory starting from a point, if it would have to expand 
and then we would have to have the light emitted, and the light would need time to get back to us. But the light from 13.8 billion light years away can't reach us yet. It's going to take time. The light we can see at most would be coming from half that distance, 6.9 billion light years away. So the fact that we can see objects more than 6.9 billion light years away tells us that the Big Bang Theory violates the speed of light limit. Then we have number nine, the speed of light and black hole problems mean the universe cannot start from a point. If you had material density great enough to cause black hole, that material would never expand into the universe. And it can have expanded to greater than 6.9 billion light years away, yet at least observable to us without violating the speed of light. And that tells us that you can't have an origin at a point in expanding, that all matter had to have originated on a much larger scale, the scale of the entire universe. So the Big Bang would have happened to, would have had to have happened everywhere at once. And this goes to 10, the inflation theory is not real physics. Inflation theory requires that space expand, even though space is dimensionless. Inflation theory uses spatial expansion to try to get around the speed of light limit by saying that matter can just go along for the ride with space as space expands and go much faster than the speed of light, but not really violating it. But the quantum field is there. The quantum field rest frame is the dimensions are fixed. The speed of light limit is fixed. So there is no magical spatial expansion that violates the speed of light limit of the quantum field. Now 11, the Big Bang has a fine tuning problem. That basically we look at whether the Big Bang would continue to expand or collapse, or is it going to expand to infinity, or, or is it just going to reach a point and stop? So under the Big Bang model, it has to be highly fine-tuned to be at this balancing point to match exactly where we are. And it was said that this required that it be accurate to 10 to the 59 decimal places. And so it's highly unlikely that something would just magically be accurate to 10 to the 9, 59 decimal places to give us the universe we have now. And then that's an even bigger problem. We have number 12. Dark energy makes the Big Bang model untenable. Because that fine-tuning fine tuning problem existed before we knew there was dark energy. And once we have dark energy and we try to retune it, it, it just doesn't work. Because dark energy is a force causing expansion of the universe. And that also means that some of the expansion we're seeing must have been caused by dark energy. if not all the expansion. And so Big Bang theorists have to go back and include this expanding force that we know as dark energy. Now one of the ways out of this may be, as some scientists have discovered, the evidence for dark energy isn't as solid as we thought back when the Nobel Prizes were handed out. And so perhaps it isn't real. And that might be uh, some, something to simplify whatever model we come up with for the development of the universe over time. But dark energy also has the problem that the Big Bang doesn't have energy for the dark energy. There's not an energy source to explain where the dark energy comes from. 
what the current inflation theory based model says that negative gravity causes expansion. And they neglect to say that there's no source for this negative gravity, no source of energy for this negative gravity. But then they say once the gravity causes expansion, then the gravity reverses and you have gravitational potential energy. So they can get their gravitational potential energy for free by using the expansion that they don't explain. And then they say that the gravitational potential energy gets converted into all the other forms of energy like mass in the universe. But the gravitational potential energy actually doesn't get converted and there's no theory for how gravitational potential gets converted into mass of particles, which it doesn't. So that whole theory is nonsense, but nowhere in that theory is there energy for the dark energy to pop out of it, just like there's no energy for the quantum field. And then when we're talking about particles, we have 14. Protons, electrons, neutrons, helium, hydrogen, etc. are produced continuously. Part of the lie about the Big Bang model is they say that electrons, protons, neutrons, helium, hydrogen could only be produced during the Big Bang. And then production stops. Well, the quantum field determines the physical constants, all of them, not just permittivity, permeability, and the speed of light, you get electric charge, Planck's constant, fine structure constant, you get the mass of the proton, mass of the electron, the magnetic moment of the proton and electron, and everything else, including gravity, can be extracted as emergent phenomena coming from the quantum field. So the laws of physics, as we know them, have been the same because the quantum field distribution is the same. There's a continuum of quantum fluctuations that cause us to have the physical, set of physical constants that we have. And most people think that matter can be produced rather than having existed for infinity. So once we have a quantum field from which electrons, protons, and other forms of matter can be produced, they can be produced at any time. And there's actually scientific evidence that they are. Early experimenters found hydrogen would pop out of their cathode arc discharge experiments. And then J.J. Thompson found that from hydrogen he could get deuterium and tritium and helium. And with helium and oxygen together, he could get neon. So all the genesis of the atomic elements can be done in a laboratory. But Big Bang theorists have been suppressing this type of research and denying the research. Because once you have an explanation of matter production that doesn't require a Big Bang, that severely weakens the Big Bang Theory. And similarly, number 15, the cosmic microwave background must be continuously produced from the quantum field. If you actually study the quantum field theory, we have a case where, or the cosmic microwave background, we have a black body radiation, a very precise black body radiation that's coming from everywhere in the universe and it has the same color temperature, the same energy as its source, which tells us there's a great uniformity in the quantum field because black body radiation is, comes from the, the quantum field. It requires a quantum fluctuation interaction of some kind. If it were objects of like dust that were moving with respect to the quantum field, 
then we wouldn't be able to identify the cosmic microwave background rest frame, which is the same as quantum field rest frame. And it would smear the data, you would have larger error bars in the measurement of black body radiation. So the cosmic microwave background signal is coming from the quantum field itself, which requires that some energy is being deposited in the quantum field that's being picked up by quantum fluctuations and converting them to photons. So the cosmic microwave background is very strong support for the existence of the quantum field, but not strong support for the existence of the Big Bang. We just need to determine where this energy comes from. And the two main theories are light or matter production. And it's probably one of those, or a combination of the two, perhaps. But probably just one because of the nature of the energy being so highly defined at 2.7 Kelvin. And then 16, stars, galaxies, superclusters are older than the universe. So at least some of them are. There are stars within our own galaxy when they measured the age, they were older than the universe. So, of course, they fudged the age so that it would match the Big Bang Theory because they couldn't have that. And the same thing happens with galaxies. We can see galaxies 10 billion light years away that appear to be as old or older than we are, our galaxy. And same thing with superclusters that far away the superclusters that must have taken 20 billion years or more to develop because, and we know that because the number of metals in there, because it takes time for the metals to develop in space. They can't be first generation stars forming first generation superclusters that have metals that make them look as old or older than the Milky Way galaxy even though they're 10 billion light years away, so they have to be at least 10 billion light years older. So all the evidence actually tells us that we have a universe that's older, much older than 13.8 billion years. And then there are the problem with walls and voids that are older than the universe. The largest void is a billion light years across. And that a void being an empty region of space with very little uh, matter in it, very few stars and galaxies. So in order for us to have concentrations of space, of matter in some areas, the, the walls and voids in other areas, it would take time for this distribution to occur. And most stars in a local region only move at about 1,000 kilometers per second relative to each other. And if you consider stars emptying a void at a speed of 1,000 kilometers per second, it's going to take a couple hundred billion years. And at more realistic velocities, it might take a trillion years. So we're looking at the overall structure in our universe could easily tell us that the universe is more than a trillion years old. But we just don't know the evolution of the universe over time on that scale because studying it has been suppressed by the Big Bang theorists. Then we have the horizon problem, which is one of the traditional problems stated that this side of the universe can't know what this side of the universe is doing because of the speed of light limit. Well, all the universe is the same because the quantum field is the same everywhere, so all the physical constants are the same everywhere. So to start with, you have all the physics, all the natural laws of physics are the same everywhere because of the quantum field. And that solves most of the horizon problems. But there's also the issue that the fields actually propagate faster than the speed of light. And we can tell that when we deal with the absorption of a photon. When absorption goes through space, 
with the photon goes through space and hits an object where it's absorbed, it has electric and magnetic fields that are propagating out toward infinity. Well, those electric and magnetic fields collapse instantaneously at the moment of absorption and disappear. So that's kind of built into the model of photons, that the electric and magnetic field propagation is instantaneous. And yet physicists will say, well, it can't violate the speed of light. But if it did, then the energy in those fields would be lost. And what some people don't, don't say is that half of the energy in a photon is in its fields. That's part of quantum field theory that Einstein and Hawke discovered over 100 years ago, that half of it, the energy is in the field energy that goes with an object. That's why in many cases when we're doing uh, math on energy, we only use one half. We use the half that we see and we neglect the half that's in the field. Well, when you're dealing with photon absorption, you have to have all of it. If you lost half of the energy every time a photon was absorbed, you'd have a lot of energy going into the quantum field. Which obviously doesn't happen. Then we have the magnetic monopole problem. They will say that there's a magnetic monopole, there should be magnetic monopoles. Well, actually there aren't magnetic monopoles because the quantum field is filled with dipoles. And when dipoles rotate, they form a north pole and a south pole, always. And so anyone who knows quantum field theory knows that the magnetic fields emerge because you have rotating dipoles. And the dipoles do have separate electric and positive charges, electric negative charges, negative and positive charges. But they don't have separate north and south poles, as would be necessary for a magnetic monopole. When you take a bar magnet with a north and south pole and you cut it in half, each piece has a north and south pole. And when an electron moves and causes a quantum fluctuation to rotate, the rotating quantum fluctuation has a north and south pole. So there are no magnetic monopoles. So it's not really a problem with the Big Bang model, it's a problem with physicists who don't understand the underlying physics of magnetism. And then number 20, the static universe models are better. There are ways to avoid all of the problems I've stated with static universe models, and there are many more. You start with the quantum field, and you have matter that pops out of, into existence in the quantum field and it forms filaments which form stars and galaxies and everything else that we know exists. And all the interactions we see are due to force interactions and those forces are based, with quantum field, are based on quantum field interactions. So it's far simpler to avoid all these problems and just do away with the Big Bang model, which is what we should. Now, for those who study astrophysics, there's a lot more uh, problems with the Big Bang that, that people can go through, but I wanted to give you a quantum field theorist perspective. And I hope it's enlightening. Uh, we really need to do away with the Big Bang theory and start over with basic quantum field theory. And one of the keys is going to be understanding how the electrons and protons are produced. We really need to know how electrons and protons are produced without any matter in order to know how the universe evolves over time. And that's something I hope to study and I hope other people will study it as well. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like, share, and subscribe. And I also have some books for sale, my quantum field theory research and my particle theory research. And by buying one of my books, that helps support me. I'm an independent researcher, and so I appreciate that support. And I also have a Patreon account. 
So thanks for watching.